Good evening and welcome to the latest edition of Ashabaka's Policy Labs. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nadim Bawalsa. I'm the commissioning editor at Ashabaka, and I'm honored to be with you tonight facilitating this discussion, assessing Palestine's future through two sectors, governance, security, and the rule of law, and the economy. What does Palestine's future look like? And how would different political scenarios affect various sectors of Palestinian society? From the continuation of the status quo to the dismantling of the Palestinian Authority and to the revival of the PLO, there are a myriad of possible implications and consequences for the Palestinian economy, for security, governance, rule of law, and beyond. We ask these questions in tonight's Policy Lab as part of the ongoing Al Shabaka Matrix study, which will be published in the months ahead. The Al Shabaka Matrix is a policy driven research initiative. It engages with and leads a Palestinian led uh, scenarios assessment exercise and explains the implications and consequences of the future political options and scenarios for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza from both policy and sectoral perspectives. The matrix presents and analyzes five interlinked and interdependent scenarios that Palestinians are likely to encounter in the near, in the near future, namely the continuation of the status quo, the dismantlement collapse or reconfiguration of the PA, the revival of the PLO, the escalation of popular confrontation with the Israeli occupation or the outbreak of a new Palestinian intifada, and an abrupt development such as the vacancy of the office of the president or the formation of a new legislative council. Furthermore, the matrix adopts a sectoral approach and therefore it analyzes the implications and consequences of these different scenarios on specific sectors. In other words, it examines the interaction between the sectors themselves and the different future scenarios. In particular, the following four sectors are examined. As we mentioned earlier, governance, security, and the rule of law is one sector, the economy, education, and the social sector. The culmination of this research is presented in the format of a visual matrix hosted in the months ahead on the Al Shabaka website, both in English and in Arabic. It is accompanied by detailed background research papers written by a Shabaka policy analysts and experts, Jamil Hilal, Bilal Shobaki, Tahani Mustafa, Tariq Sadiq, and Muhammad al -Ruzi. The matrix was facilitated and curated by a Shabaka's program advisor, Ala Tartir. Thank you, Ala, for undertaking this immense project and for bringing us all together today. Tonight, we're joined by matrix contributors, Tahani Mustafa and Tariq Sadiq to discuss possible scenarios within the context of their respective uh, sectoral specialties, governance, security, and the rule of law, and the economy. Tahani Mustafa is the West Bank analyst at the International Crisis Group, where she works on issues including security and sociopolitical and legal governance in the West Bank. She holds a PhD in political and international studies from the School of Oriental and African Study, SOAS, at the University of London. She's based between the UK, Jordan, and Palestine. Tariq Sadiq holds a PhD in economics from the University of Evry-Val de Somme in France, where he was engaged in the Palestine Solidarity Movement and served as head of the General Union of Palestinian Studies. Tariq is assistant professor in the Department of Economics at Birzeit University. He has published on monetary policy, macroeconomics, econometrics, labor economics, income inequalities, and entrepreneurship. He's also a researcher in, Palestine, in Palestine's Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. Thank you both for being with us tonight. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to remind our viewers of the format of our policy labs. For the first 30 minutes or so, I'll pose the same two questions to each Tara and Tahani based on their respective research and findings. During the second half, Tahani and Tara will answer questions from you, our audience. Throughout the discussion, please submit your questions by clicking on ask a question, which appears below. And remember that you can vote on the questions you'd like asked. If possible, please direct your question to one of our speakers, and I will do my best to address as many of the questions as I can. So let's begin. Uh, Tahani, I'd like to begin with you. Um, based on your observations and analysis, uh, which of the five scenarios do, be, do you believe is most likely to occur in Palestine in the near future and why? Thank you, Nadim. Um, so I don't want to start off on a pessimistic note, but uh, in the paper, I do map out the way that the uh, security forces uh, can either essentially facilitate or hinder um, any prospects for change. So we, like you said, map out um, five different scenarios. But I think 
given the way that the security forces currently stand, uh, we're most likely going to end up seeing the first scenario play out, which is the continuation of the status quo uh, in a degraded form. Uh, and here's why. <laughs> so when we sort of look at the way that the security apparatus in Palestine has been built, the rationale behind it that has then subsequently shaped uh, its operationalization, the entire rationale was essentially designed, or the entire Palestinian administrative uh, state building process was designed as it stands today, uh, you know, towards facilitating Israel's security interests um, specifically. So the idea here was that Israeli security and Israel's occupation, um, you know, was to be um, betrayed by these um, quasi-state building institutions. You know, Israel at the time, oh, sorry, currently still does, the rationale of its occupation, especially today when we speak of Oslo, is to essentially control the territory without wanting to actually have to administer or take any kind of economic or logistical responsibility over the indigenous population on that territory. And, you know, that was very much built into, um, or those structures were very much built into any kind of peace plan since the 1970s, although the, the kind of image for it was, you know, vastly different if we map out from the Elon plan to what we ended up with Oslo. But essentially the rationale was still there. Um, and that's what we ended up with today. Uh, so we have a security infrastructure that, like, you know, many have previously um, you know, very much uh, categorized as a kind of subcontractor to the occupation. But I think that kind of misses a lot of the nuance as well that has sort of taken shape in the last three decades as well. Um, and, you know, the security forces have changed, the security sector has changed over the last three decades. Um, and a lot of that has been shaped by not only uh, international funding and logistical support, but also uh, Palestinian leadership that has really played a part in the way that we, or, or to what we see today, the apparatus that we've seen unfold today. Uh, so if we go back to, for example, the, the, the first decade of Oslo, the Palestinian security forces, they were provided international funding, but there was very little micromanagement from international donors. And also you had, uh, you know, you had them being administered under the leadership of Arafat, who still very much advocated for things like, um, you know, at least covertly armed resistance, you know, the way that he would leverage the security forces in order to put pressure on Israel when needed. Um, and he did that, you know, through numerous ways, whether it was withholding, uh, uh, you know, um, intelligence information, uh, you know, not being entirely cooperative when it came to security coordination, refusing to arrest certain, you know, political suspects, whatnot. He had various mechanisms of doing that. Uh, more importantly, the way he leveraged the security forces as, as a linchpin for his rule, it wasn't at, to the degree that we see today under Abbas. And that's had that's had huge, huge ramifications for for the importance of the security sector, um, especially especially during the the kind of last two decades. Um, so that was under Arafat. Also, I think Israeli paranoia had a lot to do with the limited international involvement at the time. So a lot of or, or at the time, a lot of international money that was going in, it was centered around programs that were very much oriented towards uh, counterterrorism. But they were very you know ad hoc, inconsistent, and and, and very limited. And then you had the second intifada. And at that point, Israel realized that the security architecture that was built was not serving its interests. And that's where you really saw um, international intervention come in and start to really revamp uh, uh, Palestinian security forces within the image that Israel had initially intended it to be, which is the subcontractor, essentially. Uh, and, you know, at the time during the second intifada, I mean, you saw a huge, huge, vastly different attitude amongst the security forces. You know, at the time, a lot of them did get involved in armed resistance. A lot of them did facilitate, you know, the, the kind of um, break in the status quo that we saw. Um, and many of them have paid the price. Many of them are still in Israeli prisons today. And so at the time, when Israel realized that that security infrastructure was not working to its advantage, there was a huge, uh, you know, huge international push to, to revamp the entire sector, especially when you had, um, you know, the de facto government of Hamas come in, uh, you know, Hamas's takeover of Gaza. And so not only do we see more money being pumped in, we actually saw a lot more uh, internet, Western international facilitation of that process um, and micromanagement of that process. So it became more of a triadic relationship between what Israel wanted, what the international community would provide and what the Palestinians are willing to accept, um, which was pr practically anything and everything. Coupled with the fact that you had then at the time a change of Palestinian leadership. So we had the death of Arafat and then the, the um, you know, the, the coming of uh, Mahmoud Abbas. 
And Abbas has, you know, he's a very divisive character. His rule is very much, you know, based on divide and rule. But he leveraged the security sector to his advantage to the degree where today, uh, if you look at any contenders for his succession, they all come from the security forces. In order to leverage any kind of real political influence within Palestinian politics today, you need to come or need to have the backing of the security forces. And that really says a lot. So that's, you know, that's one thing. But on the other hand, you also had, as well as the socio-political and economic changes we saw that came uh, with this kind of new security infrastructure that, that started taking place, you also saw a sort of, I don't want to use the word psychological indoctrination, but I'm not really sure how else you could really classify it. And to give you an example, or to give you an anecdote, you know, in, in some cases where you would have Palestinian security force training, International donors, for instance, if they're trying to give them um, a course on leadership training, they'll deliberately um, sort of uh, pick certain, for example, uh, visual um, aids. For example, there was a discussion whether to provide Invictus or Master and Commander as, as a kind of, you know, a, a, um, as a film in order to provide some of that training, right? Because the idea was we can't give them Invictus because it's too close to reality. So they opted for Master and Commander. I mean, that's how, you know, we're talking about that level of ridiculous indoctrination. Um, but it does matter. Ultimately, it does matter. You know, you then had processes where uh, people over the age of 40 were pushed into retirement. Uh, you know, they brought in new cadets who were younger, who had been very much brought and, born and brought up and raised in this Oslo infrastructure, could not imagine a time before it. And so that really then started to alter the shape in it, or, or the, the way that these um, new cadets really understood Palestinian national interests and how that should then be operationalized. And we've seen that. We've seen that unfold on the ground. We've seen that when it comes to the schisms we see between Palestinian security forces and protesters. We've seen that during the unity in the father. If you compare the role of the Palestinian security forces who were very much active and physically partook in that process during the second in the father and compare that to what we saw back in May, and the way that they were then complicit in undergoing a mass arrest campaign. And then, you know, the horrendous events that then unfolded afterwards, where we saw a severe repression of, of opposition. I mean, it was a huge, huge marked difference between what we saw back during the first decade and what we ended up seeing today. And, you know, a lot, it, it's... It's interesting because a lot of Palestinian security force, uh, you know, um, recruitees would often rationalize that. They rationalize that in the sense that compared to what we saw rationalized back in the Second Intifada, where it was like, you know, they would essentially um, justify their actions and partaking in these sorts of actions as though they are protecting Palestinians. That's their job as a security sector is to protect Palestinian security. Compare that to today, where you would have a different kind of rationalization, where it's, um, you know, where, where the justification will always be. Well, we're doing our job to protect Palestinian society by preventing them from, you know, upending the status quo and, and, and having Israel inflict mass, uh, you know, punishment. So that's huge. That's really huge in the way that they then understand Palestinian national interests and try and operationalize that on the ground. And so if anything, I think this time round, we really saw how the security forces can actually hinder any potential or any eruption of the status quo, um, which is, you know, incredibly sad, but it's also been, you know, it's, it's been part of a concerted uh, Israeli and internationally backed effort. And I think it's unfortunate to say that they have almost succeeded to that degree, um, you know, to ensure that the kind of mass mobilization that we saw during the first Intifada, which is what Oslo was a response to, you know, unfortunately, Oslo, again, was a response to an immediate political problem, right? It was an immediate solution to an immediate political problem on both the Palestinian side and the Israeli side. And again, we saw that uh, with, with the kind of uh, roadmap and, and uh, the quartet principles and, and all of those things that then influenced the change in the security sector back in 2005. Again, that was a response, that was a political response to a political problem. Um, and the security forces became very central to that process of having to rebuild the administrative structures of the PA that Israel then destroyed. And that's what we've seen today, which is, you know, an incredibly corrupt um, and incredibly authoritarian security infrastructure. Um, that is being headed, headed and leveraged by political elites to serve a particular interest. And as much as we would like to, you know, uh, classify them as subcontractors subcontract to Israel, there's also another nuance that we have to remember here, which is as elite interests have uh, kind of shifted, you know, where their material interests have shifted, so has almost their psychology in that regard. So even political and security elites have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. Let's not forget that the security forces <clears throat> 
yes, as much as you know, a significant amount of investment goes into that, uh, they provide one of the few institutions for majority of Palestinians who do not hold you know, um, uh, certificates of higher education. So in that sense, you've also had huge segments of, of the Palestinian population being almost pacified um, through processes of institutionalization like that. Mm -hmm. Let's not also forget that you know, access to the security forces provides you access to huge amounts of international donor funding and money. Um, you know, speaking of which, what's happening today when we see clashes in refugee camps and we're seeing the PA not being able to control these and even Israel, you know, being completely unable to control these. Let's not forget that a lot of these um, armed factions in these refugee camps are being armed and supported by um, different unit commanders within the Palestinian security forces as well, which the international community are very much aware of. They are aware that a lot of that money and logistical support they provide often goes to these sorts of armed factions. So there's almost a manipulation of that kind of chaos in order to leverage their own political interests as well. So unfortunately, what it's created is a situation where we have this huge security um, architecture um, that is not only supporting Israeli domination, but it's doing it so as to leverage um, the vested interests that we've now seen the Palestinian leadership um, so deeply entrenched uh, in these current systems of domination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tanani. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, um, let's say, sobering um, insight on on what the status quo is and why it's likely to continue. Uh, thought it. Let's turn to you with the same question uh, based on your uh, observations and analysis as as an economist. Which of the scenarios do you believe is most likely to occur in the near future, and why? Thank you, Nadim. Uh, well. It's the same as Tahani. I think that the status quo scenario is the most likely to to persist. Uh, uh, let, let's see what is the status quo scenario. Uh, the status quo scenario, which is a continuation of today's economic realities and economic dynamics uh, of the Palestinian economy, uh, uh, the 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 main headline of these realities is uh, deeper dependency of the Palestinian economy on Israel uh, and uh, more and more strengthened uh, subjugation of the economy and of the people uh, to uh, Israeli control. Uh, currently. Economic activities in West Bank and Gaza are uh, recovering from the effects of COVID-19 pandemics. But uh, looking at the, the sectors of the economy, the productive sectors of the economy, those uh, which are uh, uh, more exposed to restrictions by Israel and, to, uh, uh, and which have not been uh, experiencing development policies by the Palestinian Authority, uh, they are less able to to recover, and they are more more uh, vulnerable to uh, during this crisis. Um, uh, so, for instance, the sectors which mostly employ uh, unskilled labor. Uh, where these workers are uh, working in informal conditions, they have uh, less benefits than other sectors, they, they uh, are more uh, vulnerable, they were more vulnerable to, to the crisis. Um, but other sectors such as education, health, communication, the financial sector, they uh, they rapidly recovered from the, the pandemic, uh, which means that the, uh, the inequalities in the Palestinian economy are widening. Uh, the agriculture sector specifically uh, is suffering since a long time from restrictions uh, on access to land and water, specifically after Oslo agreements. Uh, 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 and they suffered from a lack of policies that help the sector. So this sector is, decli is declining its activity 
since a long time. It is clear that the problems in the economy of the West Bank and Gaza Strip uh, are not only related to the pandemic, uh, the restrictions on access to land, water and resources are the most factors of uh, hindering the uh, economic activity. Uh, in addition, after a period of neoliberal policies by the PA uh, under the dictation of donors uh, through conditional inflow of international aid, uh, especially between 2008 and 2013, uh, which led to what was known as the illusion of growth, uh, state building and development under occupation. The, the economy of the West Bank and Gaza returned to a long contraction since 2015, even before the pandemic. Uh, the neoliberal policies in uh, the West Bank and Gaza were, uh, uh, or among these policies, the, uh, uh, the increase in loans to the to the to the private sector and to uh, uh, to consumers to households. Uh, we see the the results of these uh, uh, policies now and since 2016, where. Uh, uh, financial vulnerability is increasing, the uh, percentage of non-performing loans, for example, is increasing, the percentage of return checks is also increasing. So all these are results of the uh, neoliberal policies which oriented debt to the, uh, to the private sector and to Palestinian households. Uh, Another form of inequalities uh, in, uh, within the Palestinian economy is regional inequalities, inequalities between the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The economy in Gaza demonstrates clearly the deep impoverishment policies by Israel and what Sarah Roy called the de-development policies in Gaza Strip, which the Israeli governments impose since a long time. Poverty in Gaza Strip is, is estimated around two thirds of the population uh, after the recent attack in 2021. Uh, so we, we are seeing widening inequalities between the West Bank and Gaza and also widening inequalities within the West Bank and within Gaza Strip. Uh, in, in the status quo, uh, we see that international aid is mostly addressed to uh, security and governance. And this is intersecting with uh, what uh, Tahani was saying. Uh, thus, if international funding to the PA uh, increases in the next years, th this would probably go to the re-establishment of or, the, or for reinforcement of the Palestinian security forces, uh, which is an aid directed to maintain the status quo and enforce security forces to, to maintain this situation. Uh, for example, the new appointment of 1,000 uh, new security officers in the Palestinian Authority recently in April, I think, is an evidence of uh, uh, for this direction of uh, uh, in, in enforcing the, the Palestinian security. Uh, thus, I think that the uh, main theme of the uh, status quo is the con continuation of the increase in inequalities uh, within the Palestinian economy, geographical inequalities, sectoral and social inequalities. Uh, this would result in higher uh, or deeper dependency of the Palestinian economy on Israel. Uh, we, we would probably see higher supply of labor uh, 
of Palestinian workers in uh, in the working in the, in the Israeli economy. Uh, uh, this is emphasized by uh, the trade relationships with with Israel. The, the dependency relation is emphasized by the trade dependency of the Palestinian economy with Israel. Uh, while the trade sector is the only sector in the Palestinian economy which is witnessing increasing productivity mm -hmm. uh, since uh, since almost 2008. Uh, the deeper dependency is increasingly institutionalized uh, uh, in, in the Israeli system. Uh, for instance, the role of the Israeli civil administration uh, uh, exceeded the, the role of security coordination, uh, issuance of permits, issuance of the, or controlling the uh, population registry and IDs uh, to include policies towards the Palestinian economy and towards the economic activities, specifically in area C of the West Bank, yeah. such as the project which is was funded by the quartet uh, which is the door-to-door -door project which is so uh, uh, directed to uh, 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 to to support palestinian firms which are exporting products to the israeli economy okay conditional to security coordination with the israeli civil administration mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, this form of dependency enforces the control by Israel on all elements of the economy and goes beyond to, uh, to beyond that to a subjugation of the economy and the population to a mm -hmm. system of control where Palestinian resistance against colonization and against apartheid can be punished for example, mm -hmm. by reducing the number of permits of, for workers or by cuts of the clearance revenues to, mm -hmm. to, to, the, to the Palestinian authorities, such as the cuts of the, uh, uh, the bills of salaries mm -hmm. to, to, to the Palestinian prisoners. Uh, so these dynamics are going to continue mm -hmm. in the status quo scenario. And Israel has interest to to maintain this status quo scenario. Thank yes, you. Uh, thank you, Tare. I'm sorry to have to um, uh, unmute myself while you're speaking, but just in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to ask mm -hmm. you both the the latter half of of, of the questions, uh, and if if we can be as as brief and concise, so we can move on to the uh, the Q and A from the audience. But given the likelihood that this status quo scenario will persist, uh, which you both agree it will, uh, which policies, Tahani, uh, do you believe should be implemented moving forward? Policies which would, uh, which would need to occur in order to ensure the most viable scenario for Palestinians uh, regarding governance, security, and rule of law? Um, so just to for the effort of saving time, uh, I'll just quickly summarize. Um, so in the paper, we, sorry, I do um, outline, uh, I think five or six different recommendations, uh, things like, you know, um, uh, inclusive and legitimate renewal, um, you know, so, so as to, to merge uh, the geographical divide and institutional divide between Gaza and West Bank, um, which can help overcome, uh, especially some of the authoritarian tendencies we've seen through security governance uh, you know, at, at the way that Hamas and, and Fatah have tried to use that to, to suppress each other in their respective uh, political enclaves. Um, you know, that's definitely fed into the authoritarian uh, tendencies of, of, of the respective security sectors. Um, you know, there's also um, 
the processes of, of uh, ownership, uh, you know, ensuring that Palestinian Palestinians have ownership of the process of security reform and judicial reform, and ensuring that you know there there are checks and balances and accountability, um, you know, being integrated into those processes of reform. Uh, you know, these are all good and well, but I think ultimately, and again, I hate to be <laughs> the voice of pessimism here, but I think we're in a bit of a catch twenty two. I think the problem here is not necessarily a lack of innovation uh, or ideas when it comes to policy reform. The problem here is the, is the lack of political will. And it's even more, uh, you know, um, it's, it, it, it's a stickier situation when you're talking about how the, the fact that the Palestinian Authority is so dependent on Western international aid. And unfortunately, that dependency creates a, a situation where you have an unequal um, balance of power. So any kind of reform is going to inevitably come with conditions, uh, conditionality. And that conditionality, unfortunately, um, is, is very much, you know, underscored by some political interests. And those political interests never, ever seem to align with Palestinian, um, when we talk about South Palestinian, uh, national interests or self-determination. So it really doesn't matter how much we try and advocate, um, you know, for certain reform policies, we're always going to be stuck in that kind of catch-22. Um, and I just think that's something that we really do have to have to bear in mind. You know, it's, it's not that there is a lack of policy innovation here. It's the lack of political will, especially when we're talking about the level of economic dependency uh, we're seeing um, an econo economic dependency on certain states and, and certain countries. Thank you, Tahani. Um, uh, let's move on to Tarek because uh, we have questions coming in and they are brilliant and I'd like to get to them. But Tarek, uh, within the, the, sec the economic sector and given the likelihood of a status quo scenario persisting, which policies uh, would you believe should be implemented moving forward to ensure um, a viable economic sector for Palestinians? Well, I think that uh, the the policies in need now for the Palestinian economy are policies to to increase the resilience of the Palestinian people and to uh, uh, to help the Palestinian people to to sustain its resistance against occupation against colonization. This would go through. Uh, uh, specific policies which help the agriculture sector, for example, which is the sector which is uh, uh, resisting against colonization and confiscation of land. Uh, uh, policies which uh, uh, intend to uh, reduce inequalities, uh, whether between regions uh, of the West Bank and Gaza, or uh, with it or between social groups of uh, of the Palestinian population, uh, the <clears throat> such policies uh, uh, would be uh, whether at the fiscal level, at fiscal policies, or at uh, the social policies, or at the uh, uh, education, health sectors. Okay, so these are interacting with with all sectors. Uh, in the Palestinian economy. Um, I think <clears throat> that uh, among uh, policies which uh, can reduce inequalities and uh, help workers, uh, f especially workers, to, uh, uh, to, to be more resilient uh, under the increasing risks in the Palestinian economy uh, are uh, policies which uh, promote the presence of unions, trade unions uh, 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 for workers, which protect their rights, which uh, contribute to uh, uh, some solidarities uh, for, between workers uh, uh, or between social groups in the Palestinian economy. Thank you. Thank you, Tare. Uh, unions, a critical topic, absolutely. Uh, maybe we can get to that in the Q&A, but um, let's move to the Q&A and let's start with Tahani. Uh, a, a yes or no question, but please feel free to elaborate. Um, are privately armed US security companies uh, at work on behalf of some Palestinian factions, as, uh, as far as you know? And I suppose what, what uh, not that I'm aware of. 
Sorry, uh, sorry, I missed the last. Uh... In, in terms of what implications would it mean if there are uh, security apparatuses funded by 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 U.S. companies and so on? Yeah. Um, so in terms of private security companies being in service of the armed factions, uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, there definitely are, well, there were private uh, U.S. security companies involved in the training of the Palestinian security forces themselves. Um, you know, that's a, a whole very large subject in and of itself in terms of the um, uh, kind of conflict and, and, and economic and social and political aspects of all of that. Um, but yes, there were absolutely private security companies. A lot of the, the training, especially from the US side, was being contracted out to private security companies like DynCorp, uh, Blue Force. Um, but in terms of them working uh, for directly for Palestinian armed factions, I, I'm not that I'm aware of. I find that very unlikely. Thank you, Tahani. Uh, also, a yes or no question for for Tarek, but um, feel free, of course, to uh, uh, to uh, elaborate. Is there a productive project in the West Bank or Gaza, other than agriculture, that is directed or likely to go in the direction of production for autonomy in any field or for export? Sorry, can you repeat? I don't know. There was is there a Sure. Is there a productive project in the West Bank or Gaza, other than agriculture, that is likely to lead to uh, uh, autonomy uh, in terms of production or export? Yes, the, of course. Uh, uh, agriculture is one sector which uh, uh, can help to reduce the dependency of the Palestinian economy, but uh, for example, the, the manufacturing sector, the, uh, uh, it suffers from restrictions on uh, the entry of equipments, machines, uh, specifically in Gaza. So uh, uh, development in, in, the, in this sector would really increase the uh, uh, re reliance of the Palestinian economy on its own resources and and on and decrease the dependency. Thank you, Tare. Um, back to you, Tahani. Uh, let's see. So, what are the prospects for the security forces holding together uh, in a post Abbas scenario, given that there are likely to be power struggles in any succession and affiliations of different elements of the security forces to different power brokers? Uh, this actually would tie into the one the the fourth scenario which is the sort of sudden death or the the vacancy of the presidency office um so please to hand me uh, what are the prospects for the security forces holding together in that scenario um well the current context doesn't really lend itself to a civil war um not just in terms of uh you know the Palestinian side, but also the Israelis were very unlikely to allow something like that to to kind of escalate because that would obviously Im have implications for Israel itself. Um, ultimately, I think it's we're most likely going to see some kind of power sharing arrangement uh, come succession. Um, you know, like I said, political and security elites, which have become one and the same thing, have such a huge vested interest in 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 the current um, systems and 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 structures that it's very unlikely that they're going to destroy it <laughs> ultimately. So I think most likely um, they'll come to some form of agreement um, just because of, of how significant um, in terms of their material interests are in the current system. Uh, Tahani, let's let's stay with you for another, another question about the security sector. Um, are there any detailed statistics about how much aid is going to the sector and who are the most important players or donors besides the United States, since this is connected to that first question? It's actually really hard to get a consistent figure uh, in terms of a, a one consistent funding stream to the security forces. Um, and that, I think, is in part deliberate. Um, because not only do you have official figures that you can easily access online, uh, but also you have, uh, don't forget, bilateral uh, donations that go either from, uh, you know, one security uh, sector from a particular donor state to directly to that particular security sector that they're funding and training. It often tends to go 
to sign individuals within that security sector, or sorry, within that uh, particular security force uh, on the Palestinian side. Um, there's also the fact that figures for, especially when we talk about the preventative and general intelligence, those figures are not disclosed and made public because a lot of that money and training comes from US and European, different European state uh, intelligence sectors as well. So it's very, very difficult to get a, a consistent idea of how much actual, how, actually how much money is going into the security forces precisely for those reasons, um, because a lot of it is done through bilateral under table back channeling. So we thank you, Tahani. We, we have a, an important question, um, although it might be a bit sort of uh, broad, but Tarek, let's start with you. Um, what needs to happen to move away from the status quo scenario in the economics sector? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think that uh, uh, one of the scenarios which is uh, uh, about the uh, uh, new Palestinian uprising uh, it can be uh, a result of the status quo scenario. Uh, uh, increasing inequalities, the deeper dependency of the Palestinian economy, the uh, subjugation of Palestinians to, to Israeli control uh, of all elements of life to the, of the Palestinian people uh, would uh, 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 or may lead to uh, a new Palestinian uprising, uh, which can uh, reform the, the the structure of relations uh, uh, of of Palestinians with uh, the Israeli civil administration, the Israeli occupation authorities, uh, or the the relations within the Palestinian society, which would be more uh, intended to. Uh, increase solidarities within the Palestinian people uh, and between the, the social groups of the, the Palestinian society. So I think that uh, 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 a change may result from a new uprising from uh, uh, a new uprising uh, uh, in the uh, Palestinian society uh, because uh, there's no political will at the leadership level, which uh, 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 tends to, to change the status quo. Uh, so I think that the, the status quo needs to, to get uh, towards change from, from the basis, from the people. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, same question to you, Tahani. What needs to happen to move away from the status quo scenario? Um, I think with regards to the security sector, uh, like I said, it's a it's a really difficult um, situation we're in because we're, we've kind of reached a point now where rather than facilitating any change, the security sector will be an impediment to any kind of uh, to any force for change. Um, you know, we we do see certain kind of breaks within that psychology where you have certain you know officers who tend to be a little bit rogue in terms of their thinking and the way that, you know, they try and bridge that gap between the population and, and, and the security forces. But ultimately, un unless we see a real change in terms of sources of funding, in terms of um, a leadership that isn't so vested um, in, in, in the current status quo, you know, that doesn't have material interests uh, that, are, that, that basically trump national interests, um, we're unlikely to see the security for forces effectively facilitate any, any process of change, unfortunately. Um, and why I mentioned the sources of funding is because I think, like I mentioned at the start of the presentation, um, you know, back in the first intifada, we saw the leadership taking on a more act proactive role uh, when it came to facilitating um, that eruption in the status quo. But that's because at that time, you had the PLO being funded from multiple sources, especially anti-colonial, um, you know, regimes that were undergoing their own anti-colonial struggles. And today, you're seeing that those sources of funding and money um, coming in from the various <laughs> systems um, of, of uh, you know, countries that are complicit in the very systems of domination that we even see Israel um, enforcing on, on, the, on the Palestinians. You know, whether you're talking about the US who have a notorious reputation for their own policing forces, or the Europeans, the UK, 
uh, and various other European states. So, so long as we see that um, those sources of funding and the conditionality that's always attached to that kind of money that comes in, uh, not to mention the kinds of leadership that we have today, you know, where uh, whether we're talking about Fatah in the in the West Bank or Hamas in Gaza, you know, we have two very questionable, um, you know, two authorities with very questionable legitimacy, but each have a stake in the status quo, um, you know, in different aspects of the status quo. And, you know, they have each managed to leverage and shape the security forces to reflect that um, and, and to operationalize that. So it's it's very unlikely that if we do see any kind of eruption, it's, it's definitely going to be something where we're going to see the security forces suddenly hinder that process. Um, and it's going to be certainly one that isn't going to be, you know, so linear and, and smooth sailing. Thank you, Tahani. Uh, back to you, Tare. Um, so uh, we have a question from an audience member asking specifically about uh, the West Bank and resources, uh, productive resources uh, for um, economic improvement. Uh, which resources, natural resources would exist, or if machinery or tools um, that would be able to, uh, in the West Bank, push for economic productivity? Um, well, uh, I think that the Palestinians lack uh, uh, control of uh, water resources. Uh, the 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 quantity of water sources in the West Bank is uh, enough for the Palestinian economy uh, to for consumption for agriculture uh, for for industries which uh, uh, the Palestinians have very very little control over it uh, and they buy most of their consumed water from the Israeli company, uh, which sells their water that they uh, extract from the West Bank. Uh, this is one an, one important resource. Uh, another important resource, which is uh, uh, energy, oil and gas. Uh, the, there is uh, oil in, in the West Bank, uh, which is controlled by Israel. Uh, it, is, it is close to the to the, to the green line, uh, but uh, Israel the, digs deeper in uh, beyond the, the green line. Okay, so it can have more oil in in uh, uh, in the Israeli side, uh, but they uh, prohibit the Palestinians from extracting oil in in the West Bank. The same in Gaza. They they have uh, th there is a, a, a gas source in Gaza which the Palestinians are not allowed to use or to extract gas from it. Uh, there has there was an uh, a call by the Palestinian Authority to for uh, uh, to uh, extract gas from uh, in the 1990s and since. There was no action taken from uh, to to extract gas uh, in the Mediterranean. So uh, I think that energy source is also important, specifically for for Gaza, which suffers from electricity cuts uh, uh, and uh, which hinders economic activity in Gaza Strip. Uh, so I think that these sources are would potentially have a large impact on the Palestinian economy. Thank you, Tara, and thank you to the audience for so many uh, insightful questions that keep coming in. Uh, Tahani, back to you. Are there avenues for donor accountability to the security sector that could be amplified? I mean, there ultimately should be, and I think there have been a lot of um, different Palestinian initiatives that have tried to do that, um, especially when it comes to the judicial sector, not so much with the security sector, and I think that's just it, because it's a lot, it's, it, it's a very difficult sector to kind of conquer. Um, but when it comes to the judicial sector especially, yes, there have been, um, and it's been really impressive because a lot of it has been in an internal Palestinian initiative through organizations like Musawa, for example. 
you know, that have really tried to monitor and, and, and facilitate donor funding to make it more productive and, and conducive to Palestinian needs. Unfortunately, um, a lot of that I don't think has actually been taken on board. Because even if we look at the Palestinian judici judicial sector as an example, where you do actually have initiatives to ensure some kind of donor accountability and facilitation, um, you know, again, we see um, funding for the judicial sector very scattered, very ad hoc. Uh, you know, there are situations where donors come in and try and implement things that really have no place in the Palestinian context. For example, credit card fraud at the time a few years ago, where Palestinians barely ever used credit cards when paying for anything. Um, you know, there were issues where a lot of funding that was going in for training abroad programs were being used by certain individuals to just basically have a nice vacation abroad. And a lot of Palestinian lawyers at the time were trying to draw attention to that waste of money. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the waste in terms of resources that were being offered that really could have been channeled to, to more effective avenues. Um, and really, none of that was taken on board. And the same thing with the security forces. Um, you know, there have been numerous clashes um, that have caused delays in terms of um, project turnarounds and, and, and so forth. And that often comes down to the fact that, you know, Palestinians often want training in one thing and, and international donors are unable to provide that precisely because Israel won't allow it. Um, you know, as much as we, um, you know, consider that the international um, community, Western international community are in charge of a lot of the logistical training um, and, and funding, let's not forget that Israel oversees all of that, you know, to the degree where, as an example, they used to have a, a training site here in Jordan and Israeli delegations would just turn up uninvited. And even on Jordanian soil, the Jordanians could not turn them away. They had to come in and they would observe the training to make sure that everything was being done, um, you know, precisely the way they wanted, all the way down to the kind of equipment that was being provided, whether it was bulletproof vests that weren't allowed to be impenetrable to Israeli bullets, for example. Um, so it's, there's, very li there's very limited uh, international uh, donor leverage, if we're talking about um, donor accountability in terms of what they can realistically provide, because ultimately you're not just talking about, you know, particular states or one particular entity, you're talking about having to deal with also, um, you know, Israel's broader security interests, which is essentially what it comes down to. If Israel approves, it happens. If Israel doesn't, it doesn't. Um, you know, that's it, it's unfortunate, but that's essentially how accountability is also factored in, in, in the Palestinian case. And, and so ultimately, Israel tends to be the decisive factor in terms of what is provided, how it's provided. Um, and so, you know, th again, th that's not to say that there is a lack of initiatives. It's just that the political will to implement those initiatives is not there. Thank you, Tahani. I think we have time for uh, one more each. So, uh, I thought it. Let's go back to you regarding climate uh, change and the climate uh, uh, crisis. Uh, let's let's look specifically at uh, how, how do the impacts of climate change play into economic planning, uh, if at all. Uh, and I think this would be specifically in terms of economic governance by Palestinian political bodies. Um, yes, uh, the climate change uh, um, renders water sources, for example, more and more scarce. Uh, so the scarcity of water is uh, increasingly addressed uh, uh, in the Palestinian economy. Uh, what uh, uh, th this is one side, but uh, uh, other sides of uh, uh, climate change is the vulnerability of the uh, water rainfall, for example, the, uh, uh, the increasing temperature. Uh, so uh, what the, uh, the Palestinian economy uh, suffers is the lack of uh, policies which address problems related to the to the climate change so, so for example agriculture uh, uh, agriculture products are vulnerable to uh, uh, to the to the climate change conditions uh, and this is reflected to the the prices of uh, agricultural products which are vulnerable uh, depending on the climate conditions uh, uh, I think that the, the Palestine as a Mediterranean region has the capacity for uh, 
uh, solar energy, for example, but investment in uh, this sector is uh, very limited and uh, the, the, the needed uh, infrastructure for uh, such uh, uh, sector is, uh, is very expensive in the Palestinian economy uh, uh, and is also under control by Israel for due to restrictions on access of machines, equipments needed for this sector, specifically in Gaza. Thank you, Tara. We are really getting through all these questions. Uh, Tahani, back to you in terms of in terms of governance. Uh, are there grassroots uh, local political organizations, movements or leaders that are gaining momentum, potentially filling a gap in the current political structure, uh, the, the division between Hamas and Fatah? Um, I mean, I'm sure there are, but I think ultimately the problem here is that uh, on the one hand, if we're talking about the West Bank, again, you have uh, a Palestinian authority that is being betrayed by forces bigger than local grassroots. And unfortunately, Palestinian opposition right now is so deeply divided and fragmented. It lacks leadership, it lacks strategy. Um, and what's worse is that I think the the biggest weakness for, for, for the opposition right now is that it cannot fathom uh, an alternative to the PA. So even if we're talking about dismantling PA institutions, what comes next? And that's huge when you're talking about governance, pro providing service provision and governance of, a, of, of a, something like 5 million Palestinians in the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip. Um, so I think ultimately that's where the opposition really falters. Um, but, you know, absolutely, that's not to say that grassroots activism and opposition isn't there. It's just that it's not yet in a position where it can provide a viable enough challenge um, to the current forces that it's up against. Uh, you know, we're not just talking about PA leadership here. We're also talking about PA leadership that is being betrayed by the by Western international community and Israel. Um, you know, and that those are huge to overcome. Um, but I just wanted to quickly go back, sorry if that's okay, to, to the previous question about accountability. And I just wanted to raise something um, in, in regards to, to the lack of accountability that we see in donor funding. And another aspect that I think tends to be overlooked is the Orientalist modes of policing that are often provided in this part of the world, right? When we're talking about uh, non-European parts of the world, um, in the sense that a lot of the kind of heavy handed tactics you see, a lot of the authoritarian tendencies you see are no accident, they're no unintended consequence, and they are not solely down to just um, to oppressive authorities in Gaza and the West Bank. Some of this is, is the outcome of deliberate training and logistical support, where they have been taught to treat their own people like this. You know, whether you're talking about the training that has been provided by the USSC, the United States Security Coordinator, where they deliberately um, have made no, uh, you know, secret about the fact that they are not training a policing force, they are training a gendarmerie, which is a cross between police and army. Uh, where you have military training what should be policing civil policing forces um you know where you will have often human rights classes training uh check boxes that's all fine but ultimately when it comes down to the actual uh training that is being provided it is very very heavy-handed um and that often like i said comes down to the to, to the fact that they are training a gendarmerie not a policing force and they made no secret of that and in fact a lot of them will tell you that we cannot, and this is a direct quote, I won't name who said this, but this was someone senior within the USSE who was very explicit when he said that we cannot think about policing in, quote, this part of the world, the way we would in the Western world, because people here require different tactics. Um, and I think we also just have to consider the fact that a lot of this training and logistical support is being provided by states that have their own accountability issues with their own security forces back home. So how can we expect any different here? Um, so I just thought that would be worth mentioning. I, I agree, and I think that's actually a brilliant place to stop. Um, this was such a compelling and brilliant conversation. Thank you both so much, uh, just in the interest of time, unfortunately. But um, I would love to continue, um, and the questions do keep coming in, but um, uh, we will save them for future discussions once the matrix is published. Um, so thank you to Hany and Tarek for your insights and analysis. Uh, it's, it's not easy predicting future scenarios and, and their impact on communities. And maybe it's even less uh, so uh, when it comes to Palestine and Palestinians. Uh, as we know, too well, developments there can be rather volatile.
and unexpected. But you've both given us uh, so much to think about, and not only in terms of the future, but in terms of what should and could be done in the present moment to forestall further entrenchment of the status quo and to bring about possibly, hopefully, meaningful change in Palestinians' lives. So thank you both very much uh, for being with us tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience all over the world for attending and for submitting your thoughts and questions. Uh, please keep an eye out in the coming weeks uh, for Al Shabaka's Matrix study, which will be published on our site, and in which you can read much more from Tahani and Tariq, as well as several of our policy analysts at Al Shabaka. Uh, before we sign off, as always, I'd like to remind our audience that our, that our policy, policy labs, excuse me, are crowdfunded. Uh, and so we do rely on your continued support. If you're able to donate, please do so by clicking on the donate link that should now appear on your screens. Thanks again and uh, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.